Hello, uh, Steve Yadzinski here, Senior Innovation Officer at JFF with author Michelle Weiss, uh, who has uh, here generously giving some time to talk about her book, Long Life Learning. Uh, Michelle, would you mind introducing yourself to everyone? Hi, everyone. I am Michelle Weiss, and I am a Senior Advisor at Imaginable Futures, and I am delighted to be here with all of you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, really appreciated getting a chance to, to review your book uh, over the weekend and, and read many of your ideas. I'd like to dive straight in and talk about the title of your book, uh, Long Life Learning, which actually is hard for me to sort of get in my head because I've been saying it the opposite way for so long. But long life learning, we're all familiar with the opposite, obviously. Uh, could you tell us more about uh, what you mean by the title and why it's important? Yeah, the title, it, it, it's kind of meant to trip everyone up and it, it, it gets at this idea that we are all actually staying in the workforce for far longer than we had ever anticipated. And our lifespans are actually extending uh, every single year and has been basically since the 1840s. This is uh, data from the authors of the 100 year life. And so as we think about the implications of longevity, for me, it's been a really helpful mental model to kind of spur us into action because whenever we talk about lifelong learning, I think there's a lot of intuitive understanding of why it's important and a lot of nodding that happens, but there hasn't actually been a lot of that translating into action and the creation of an infrastructure for continuous returns to learning. And so that's really the motivation behind this concept is to try to help us understand that really once we start thinking about a longer work life, we start to realize that the future of work is really the same thing as the future of education. I really appreciate that, um, that idea of how long our, our, our lives are in work and the number of career transitions. You, you touch on that, um, and I personally can, can relate to that quite directly. Um, you know, and one of the things that as you get into the book a little bit, you start talking about some of the systemic challenges uh, facing all of us. Uh, I can imagine a reader feeling a little bit of like, oh, my gosh, this is all kind of like hard, you know, hard news kinds of things up front. And while you address the challenges head on, you know, you're not you're not pulling any any um, any ideas out. I really appreciate how you've laid out a vision for a new learning ecosystem that rests on five guiding principles. Uh, these are principles that need to exist in order for people to navigate more seamless job transitions. Um, I wonder if you could touch on and talk a little bit about the five principles, what they are, and how you how you settled on these. Yeah. So if we just kind of go back to your concept of um, more job transitions. Um, when we actually look at early baby boomers today, we're seeing that on average, they're experiencing around 12 job changes by the time they retire. So as we think about that extension of our lives and our work lives, it's actually not that hard for us to extrapolate and think, well, maybe we, you know, as, as folks who are still very much in the workforce, um, we'll have to anticipate 20 or 30 job changes by the time we retire. But then that suddenly can become very overwhelming when we think about how hard it is just to navigate a single one of those job changes. And so this concept of a new learning ecosystem, it's meant to be a more positive vision for the future. And it really rests on this idea of shifting our thinking away from the future of work to the future of workers. And once we start kind of going in with a laser focus on the kinds of barriers and challenges and constraints that exist for people who are currently not thriving in the labor market today, who are not earning a living wage, we can begin to unlock some of those barriers that, that, that make these transitions so inordinately difficult. And the idea is that we need a new learning ecosystem that is fundamentally more navigable, more supportive, more precise and targeted, uh, more integrated and more fair and transparent. And so with that, what, what I'm trying to do is actually surface the voices of adult learners and working learners today who are bumping into those constraints to make the case for universal design. If we actually design around these specific points, we can actually unlock a better system that all of us are going to need to rely on because we're actually all going to become 
working learners in the future. As we have to navigate those 20, 30 job changes, we need an, an infrastructure that can support that. And so the idea is this kind of idea of a curb cut effect, right? If you cut into the curb, you unlock a way forward for everyone and that we're all kind of tied in in what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called this, this web of mutuality. Um, and so that's that's really it. It's around sort of making sure that in order for us to do better, we need better career navigation uh, services. We need to understand who we are relative to where we want to go. What are the gaps that we need to fill? We need human touch points along the on the way. We need advisors and coaches to keep us accountable. We need access to support services and public benefit systems and, and ways of navigating childcare and transportation. We need a very precise and targeted educational pathway that just gives us what we need in order to move forward and get out of that mode of survival. Uh, we need those new learning experiences to be more integrated into our work days. It can't just be always something that we tack on uh, on top of everything else we have going on in our lives. So how do we have more embedded, experiential, hands-on, work-based learning opportunities? And then finally, that transparent piece is really around how do we get toward greater skills-based hiring practices, right? How do we open up on opportunity for people who've been traditionally traditionally overlooked because they may not have the right credential requirement? So all five of those things need to be true. And the, and the thing that's really important here is when we think about those five areas, I think we can all think of different solutions and organizations that work in these, in these various areas, but they're not knit together in a way that is easily understandable and comprehensible to any job seeker out there. And that's really the core of this idea of a new learning ecosystem is that all five of those things need to be true. It doesn't have to be a single player providing all of those services, but how do all of those pieces come together in service of the job seeker? Yeah, I really appreciate that. The uh, the web of mutuality, as you talked about, the future of workers, you know, shifting our concept of what it means to sort of engage with education and learning, as well as, you know, not only does our economy develop, but so do the roles develop and, and thus the, the workers within. You know, when thinking about, um, you know, you made a point uh, in the book uh, about the adult learning market. <laughs> as being much larger than sort of youth or young adult market. And, and for all the time that I've sort of like thought about this, just to reveal, I was like, oh, that's, that's a really cool and very practical way to sort of frame up the way you think about these issues. And we do see sort of colleges and universities, uh, I think, in terms of working to transition to meet the need of workers today, risking almost tripping over themselves uh, to compete for the large new market? Like, how do we build our programs to, to suit, to fit? Um, we do see a handful of institutions that are taking fundamentally different approaches, trying new things, new innovations. So my question for you is, why haven't we seen more of this happening, meaning innovation, experimentation, new models coming out of maybe traditional universities and colleges? And why do many almost seem... Um, you know, really t almost overly tied to degrees and traditional structures. What are the powers that keep them there and what prevents those institutions from being able to sort of meet us in that future of workers? Yeah, that inertia and the, the inability to respond to a changing uh, market is something that is very much um, coming out of my background as uh, someone who used to work with Clayton Christensen on his theories of disruptive innovation. And really when we talk about the inability of, in, of existing institutions to, to flex and adapt to two different needs in the market, it really comes down to the fundamental constraints of a business model. And it's, and it's true across the board, not just for higher education, it's true for you know, even some of the biggest companies out there, um, it's it's really what motivated Christensen to think about why it's so difficult to sustain success. And it really comes down to when you're actually trying to create a revenue or a profit model, there are so many pieces that have to go into play in order to deliver on just even a single value proposition. So even if we were to, and higher ed has multiple value propositions. Uh, we have 
the, the, the need to sort of teach and uh, proliferate knowledge. We have research, the production of new knowledge, and then we also have the creation of new value networks and new facilitated networks um, through the social growth of our learners. But even if we were to narrow in on one, like the teaching uh, value proposition, there are so many different resources and processes that go into play. And there's multiple iterations of cycles of, of trying to make a revenue model work that once something is working, it's inordinately difficult to kind of shove something new or divert your attention and respond to something new, uh, such as like a boot camp or an on-ramp that exists, uh, you know, maybe on the margins or on the horizon. And so it's, it's, it's not that a higher ed institution is unwilling to meet the needs of an adult learner or really kind of orient differently to the needs of an adult learner. It's just that the value proposition of serving a traditional 18 to 24 year old college going population is so strong. That pull of that sort of trajectory is so strong that it makes it very difficult to sort of switch and, and create new processes and create new uh, resources and allocate new resources to, to building those new models. So when you actually look at a lot of the different kinds of adult serving models that we have today, while there are some phenomenal programs out there, for the most part, we're still often asking many working learners to fit in their very non-linear realities into a rigidly linear system. Like we actually haven't bent a lot of our processes, a lot of our structures to, to become more flexible and convenient. So that's kind of one piece of this argument. It's, it's not that it's a lack of responsiveness. It's just that institutions are really fundamentally constrained from being uh, nimble adapters to, to the changing environment around them. Yeah, and, and picking up on that, uh, that, that idea of a rigidly linear system, you know, perhaps we can sort of think a little bit, I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of the disruptive entrants, you know. So in long life learning, you're suggesting that uh, disruptive educational offerings will emerge through the convergence of three key elements. And I wonder if you could talk about these a little bit. Um, you know, you talk about competency or mastery-based learning is the first element, the second is modularization, and the third is a value network, which we'll, we'll, we'll dive into even a little bit more fur further. I think you talked about them first in, uh, you mentioned Clay Christensen earlier, but you, you both uh, authored a book called Higher Education in 2014. So with putting the framework out in 2014 and sort of still thinking about it in those terms, how are we, how are we doing? You know, what surprised you um, what's working and what maybe do we need to get better at? Yeah. When Clay and I first wrote that book, uh, we were trying to talk about the disruptive potential of competency-based education that is aligned, that's online and modularized, that's aligned to workforce needs. And we were really excited uh, at that same time, there was kind of this burgeoning of about 600 different institutions that were signaling that they were ready to to try to experiment and pilot more with, with CBE. The problem is that we didn't actually create new, fundamentally new value networks and new uh, business channels to experiment in this, uh, in this modality. Everything was still connected to Title IV funding, trying to kind of fit into that uh, particular particular um, set of regulations. And what happened is instead of having 120 credits, we just kind of switched over to 120 competencies. And then every university started building their own sets of competencies and skill sets that they thought were important for the labor market without coordinating across. And so what you had were hundreds and thousands of competencies that really we're starting to maybe mean the same thing, but had no translation value across different sorts of institutional boundaries or state boundaries. I think there's a lot of adjustment that has been happening over the last few years. Uh, there's a new open skills network. There's different kinds of ways that people are trying to build better skills ontologies and taxonomies so that we can start connecting job market postings to the kinds of learning objectives that exist in our higher ed institutions, but still we're kind of a long way off right now in this current moment from really kind of entering into a skills-based hiring economy. Um, so we're still, 
we're still a ways off and we also haven't quite figured out how to crack the funding piece of this. When we think about long life learning, we have to remember that most of the funding mechanisms that we have today are very much geared toward that 18 to 24 year old, po year old population. And, or sometimes even just at 18, everything kind of ends in terms of thinking about reskilling and upskilling over a lifetime. Employers at the same time have really retreated from training their new workforces or their, their new uh, candidates. Um, and so it's kind of this perfect storm of challenges when it comes to really thinking about funding those more and um, varied on and off ramps in and out of learning and work. We don't actually offer that many today. And so that's just a, that's a void we need to really fill in the future. Yeah. And you've, you've been talking about value networks just in your last response. And I think you, you referenced it earlier, you know, thinking about the incentives to create some of the real systemic change. Um, you know, in, in your book, you talk about, uh, an alternative to accreditation as being an important incentive structure. Businesses hiring differently is another. Um, how optimistic are you feeling today around valuing education in new ways? I, I mean, you're, you're mentioning there's a ways to go, you know, uh, just, you know, what's your, what's your pulse on it? Are we moving in the right direction? And what are some of the incentives or triggers that, might sort of tip us into getting those financial models to work more effectively? I think, you know, I am positive in the sense that the status quo just will not be sustainable for the future. So when it comes to employers in particular, uh, constantly buying talent from the outside is, is not going to be the way forward. I think many organizations are starting to realize that they need to have a better grasp of who their people are, what kind of talent gold they're sitting on, and how do they begin to kind of usher them toward the strategic goals they have as a company. They can't always just recruit 20,000 new engineers or, you know, uh, 10,000 new data scientists. How do they start understanding maybe that there are ways in which they can figure out at a, in a more precise way the kinds of skills that people bring to the table and that maybe 30% of their workforce can be kind of skilled in this direction and 10% can kind of move in this direction. Um, my hope is kind of that, that we are seeing really interesting innovations occur in the different kinds of AI powered platforms that are helping us get at some of those skills. Because humans were just not the greatest sometimes at articulating our own uh, our own value and the kinds of skills we bring to the table. We're also not great at envisioning pathways forward for ourselves. We sometimes don't have the confidence to say, oh yeah, of course I could be a system network analyst, or I could go and be a digital marketing specialist because we don't actually know how portable our skills are. And so these, these platforms are helping us understand what truly are the kinds of transferable skills that we can move from retail and then shift over to PR marketing and advertising over here and start earning um, a much better uh, wage over here. And so those that that starts to give me hope in terms of starting to leverage technology and AI to get us smarter about the own pathways that might be available to us. The other piece of this though is say we do, realize that maybe we're 70% of the way there toward moving into human resources and being able to recruit and onboard new employees. How do we get precisely the five or seven skills that we need in order to move in that direction, right? When we need to fill in our skills gaps, we don't have a way of understanding that this pathway over here, if I take this credential out of the close to 1 million credentials that exist out there in the education and labor markets, that this will be the one that an employer really recognizes and understands. That's where we are really kind of um, needing to move much more strongly into this mode of modularizing learning so that we're not always offering a one-year certificate or two-year degree or a four-year degree when someone actually just needs four competencies, right? How do we get them exactly what they need in order to move forward? So I think that's a real, that's, that's, that's something that really remains to be developed. And that was something that uh, Clay and I wrote about back in 2014 that we haven't seen as much movement on. 
Yeah, I mean, there's so much in your response there that I'm thinking about, you know, your work on human skills, um, your work on, on, on the importance of navigation and matching. I even heard a little bit about, you know, maybe getting into assessments in terms of how do we know people might be ready to go without sort of, you know, these proxies that we've been using. Um, and there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> We'd love to dive in for 20 minutes on many of those things, but I want to make sure just being cognizant of time that, that we can zero in on, on probably one of the, the, well, it's not probably, it is the most important aspect of building a system like this is around equity. And, you know, I'm fascinated with this idea of career navigation. And I've, I've thought of it, and I think you and I maybe have even talked about it in these terms, as sort of this network of options that individuals have. It's highly complex, highly idiosyncratic based on where you might want to go, who you are, where you are in your life. You know, whether you have young kids or a little bit older can be a, a big influencer, just as one example of the kinds of things that can influence choices and so forth. You also talked about the importance of technology and AI. And I think that's a really great segue into equity because while AI has tremendous power, and I'm, I'm a, I believe strongly in it, there are also well-known examples where AI has failed us, that they, they do not have equitable results to say the least and so forth. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you think about um, equity can be ensured, how the incentives for, um, you know, sort of the business mechanics that we've been talking about how do we make sure that we create equitable pathways for, for all Americans in this case to access the same kinds of opportunities um, and meet sort of the demands of, of getting something done through these advanced technologies? Yeah, the equity piece was, you know, first and foremost, the, the centering of this book. It wasn't, this book wasn't meant to be here are my thoughts on what we should do for the future. It was really born out of these close to 100 deep dive hour long interviews with uh, folks who, who, who are part of those underestimated populations, folks who, who were really just struggling to, to make it and earn a living wage and trying to understand from their perspective what was happening. And so all five of these principles really emerged after the interview process. And we started to realize that there were these themes coalescing around navigation, wraparound support services, precision learning, uh, integrated earning and learning pathways and fair, fair hiring practices. I think the, the opportunity here, and this is something that Opportunity at Work talks about, right? When they talk about their stars or their people who are skilled through alternative routes, we have long been overlooking talent that could be deployed differently if we gave them an opportunity. And so the work that, that rests ahead for, for a lot of us is how do we build in those opportunities more deliberately? And one potential way that some of these different kinds of on-ramp providers are, are realizing maybe a path forward would be in really kind of thinking through what would the future apprenticeships look like? Right. I think the, the exciting thing about apprenticeships is that there's bipartisan excitement and support for this idea. Um, but we when we actually look at how many there are today, it's actually a relatively small pathway that exists in the U.S. Only 500,000 people pursue apprenticeships and they're mostly in kind of the skilled trades. We don't uh, or some of the quote unquote blue collar trades. We don't actually have them. Uh, for many of the the tech uh, opportunities that exist for folks. Um, and then to your point, as you mentioned, those human skills, how do we make sure that we're also broadening our human skills as we have to kind of further compete with, complement, and coordinate better with robots and machines in the future? So where do we get these kinds of learning opportunities? It could be in these different kinds of um, outsourced apprenticeship programs where different kinds of learning providers actually invest in the participants themselves, start building their human and technical skills at the same time, and then hire them directly and sort of outsource them to different employers. So employers actually get a real opportunity to test out the talent of these overlooked, traditionally overlooked populations. And that seems to be um, making some good headway in terms of employers realizing 
oh my goodness, I normally never would have given someone from this community college a chance or someone without a degree this shot. But we realized they have precisely the skills that they need in order to do the work ahead. So how do we risk the real, or how do we start, how, how do we mitigate risk in this very um, sort of, in this kind of risk averse culture that we have when it comes to hiring? Um, you're absolutely right though, in terms of bias and inequity, there's a huge challenge in terms of as we move towards skills-based hiring, how do we ensure that we're not just kind of removing the degree requirement and supplanting it with just another form of a bias that we rely on? These are things that we really have to keep in mind. And so the thing that gives me hope in, 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 this, in this area is trying to see how different kinds of learning providers are trying to connect the supply of talent to the demand of opportunity through different things like these um, apprenticeship programs. No, I really appreciate you surfacing the apprenticeship opportunities. I think that, you know, from JFS perspective, we're seeing a lot of opportunities, those you know, earn and learn opportunities where there's there's a portion that is dedicated for, for learning some of the skills, but then so many things, and especially those human skills, which are the difference makers, they need to be practiced in order for you to actually learn them. Like, sure, you can sort of get the uh, concepts. You might even be able to pass an assessment depending on how it's built. But you need that time to practice. And I, I really appreciate that you surface that as, as, as a likely solution uh, moving forward. You know, in, in, in thinking about how talent could be deployed differently, when you were working on this book, we had COVID and the economic crisis <laughs> that resulted. And, and talk about, you know, uh, talent looking for, for different opportunities in, in, in a way perhaps we've never seen before. How did that experience change your writing of the book? What, what, what happened? <laughs> At first, it was completely paralyzing because I submitted my full draft of my book two weeks before COVID hit. And so <laughs> when COVID hit, it was just sort of, a, I was paralyzed trying to figure out, do I actually need to rewrite this entire book or not? Um, what I realized is that in in the process of writing this book, my thinking was how do we galvanize people's uh, interest and enthusiasm around realizing that we already have close to 41 million Americans being left behind today, that we haven't really figured out how we're gonna pull them into this kind of future of work that we, that we keep talking about. So that was kind of my orientation is how do I get people to pay attention to this giant overlooked population of folks who only had a high school degree who were who were not thriving in the labor market. What was helpful about COVID was that it really just sort of shook our entire workforce infrastructure to its core. And it showed us how, how stuck our systems were and how siloed and how unintegrated our systems were. Because once the retail and hospitality industries were hit and really decimated in those early months. If we had had a real functioning education to workforce infrastructure, we would have been able to quickly move millions of Americans into opportunities that really were open and ready to be filled because we would have had a way to sort of account for these transferable human skills give them precisely the kinds of, you know, technical skills building training they needed to move in this other direction. We of course did not have that, right? We didn't we couldn't respond and then you just saw those those unemployment claims pile up. So I think what was helpful and generative uh, in terms of the discussion was all of that um all of that orchestration and galvanizing that I thought I would have to to do in the book in terms of getting people interested in this long overlooked population, it was kind of done for me. It was it was just sort of revelatory of how stuck our systems were. So that was that was incredibly powerful. And what it made me, all I had to kind of do was sort of go in and, and reshape different sections, but I didn't have to fully rewrite the entire book. <laughs> 
And then I, I know we're starting to come up on time here, and I have sort of one final question for you as 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 we conclude here. But I was really struck by your your the image that you created with how stuck and how siloed, you know, the roles are, and how exposed we were, you know, through COVID and so forth. And I'm sort of tying that back to where we started our conversation with the number of career transitions just everybody is likely to make, the fluidity that that we need to um, sort of accept as the economy and roles change and new roles emerge, as it says in your, <laughs> in your subtitle job that don't even exist yet today. So, I, you know, early in, in your book, you talked about the future of workers is all about, about all of us. I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, um, but I'm wondering how the dynamics and trends that you're, you're talking about in your book might affect you personally, you know? So thinking about how might you expect your own career to develop as as we go through um, all of the changes that we'll all be part of. Yeah, it's interesting. I think about this a lot because I was sort of one of those traditional liberal arts grads who, who was sort of a generalist. Um, and I think maybe early on in my career, I would have seen that more as, um, uh, as a challenge in the labor market, because it was hard to prove that I had the technical skills to do whatever the job may be. But I realized kind of the power over time, uh, the real power of synthesis, if we actually really start to understand how our education to actually, actually connect very directly to turning us and cultivating us into the best problem solvers in the world. I think that is the, that's the translation I think we may be missing in terms of helping our learners understand, you know, sometimes when we structure in academic departments and we teach through disciplinary boundaries, we forget how important it is to kind of really underscore the concept of range, right. And kind of, and taking different ideas from seemingly unrelated domains and having them make sense in what we're doing right now. Um, and that I, that I have found over time to be the skill set that I'm constantly building and working on. So um, I, I don't like when people use the term expert. Uh, like when I'm, when I'm doing my own work, I am not an expert. I'm just learning and reading and inhaling different kinds of research and trying to understand how all of this stuff kind of comes together and makes new sense in this particular challenge that I'm, that I'm looking at. So I think, you know, when I think about sort of my own path as a working learner, that has just kind of strangely been the path that I took. I, I actually started off my career as a college professor and have kind of shifted into uh, thinking about this intersection between post-secondary education and the workforce, but none of it was planned out. In a, in a deliberate way. It has just been kind of this accumulation of learning and synthesizing that learning and making it make sense in, in these new domains. That, that I think is, um, it's something that I talk a lot about in the book in terms of thinking about the importance of inquiry-based models and problem-based learning and how we need to start thinking about that in such a more intentional way as we think about building uh, building skills for these jobs that don't exist yet. Well, I so appreciate that. And as a, uh, a fellow working learner traveler, as it were, <laughs> who's also had a pretty progressive career, I really appreciate your time today. I'll just, the book is Long Life Learning, Michelle Weiss. I so appreciate your time today. And I would say uh, this is required reading today for for folks working in this space and ecosystem. It's, it's been terrific to get to know your work even more. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much.